morning. Welcome to, to Discovery Church. Um, as we uh, prepare for worship today, I invite you to join me in this opening scripture um, from Psalm 133 and then from Psalm 122. It says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And then it says, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. I invite you to join us in singing and um, this first song, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. God, as we come together this morning as a church, we do praise you. Uh, we do uh, bring our our praise to you and recognize the, the glory and the goodness that you are. And we thank you for that. Uh, we ask that you'll um, prepare our hearts now and prepare our ears uh, as Pastor Paul uh, brings your word to us this morning. Um, may we have ready feet and ready hearts uh, to receive what you have what, what you have for us this morning and be ready to move with it in your name amen
Good morning. Good morning. As we continue to go through a series on the spiritual disciplines, we come to one called fellowship. The scripture passage for this is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. You can follow along on your phone or on a tablet if you brought one, on a book, or you can follow the words that are up on the screen as I read them. The first 10 verses of 1 Peter chapter 2, I invite you to stand with me as we hear these words from the book that we love. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. For in scripture, it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that caused people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God's very word. Thanks be to God, and you may be seated. Connect Deeply is about how we personally and together draw near to the heart of God. Dallas Willard, who is the goat of spiritual disciplines, in his list includes fellowship. He describes it this way. It's a spiritual discipline of engagement. The spiritual discipline of being together. We also hold that Connect Deeply is about interconnecting and intertwining with each other. In fact, our passage is so bold as to say that the context for spiritual growth is fellowship. Now I know what you're thinking. Pastor, you like to grab our attention by saying outrageous things from time to time. And it's true because they are true. What if it is true what Peter is teaching, inspired by the Spirit, that the context for spiritual growth is fellowship? Maybe you've heard it said that people's objection to Christianity is not Jesus, but the church. And there have been historically movements and events that have not represented Christianity well at all. And yet, in spite of all of our many flaws, these verses describe a power at work that shape us into being people who live the will of God and follow the word of God. Christian fellowship is how we connect deeply. I'd like to begin as we delve into this passage to look at what it says about the church as a unified community, as one. There are several images in this passage about Christian community. Here are a few of them. 
It is made up out of a society. It is made into a society. We read, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The Christian community is not made up by a bunch of people, it says but a people who form a singular society, a group. The word nation is the word ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic. It means you have been created to be a new race, a race together of shared common values, beliefs, and practices. Now, unless you are an indigenous American, you have a certain ethnic background or maybe a combination of them. There are probably certain things in your ethnic background that in which the people of that nationality share common values, beliefs, practices, traditions. They're what tie us together. He's saying the same is true of the church, a new nation with common values, beliefs, and practices. The church is stones built into a temple, which he calls a spiritual house. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Back in the time of the first century, in the time of Peter, religions would go to a temple because at that temple is where you have access to God. That's where you would gather for worship. It has to be at the temple. Each religion had a class of priests who were dedicated to doing the work of their gods. And they had a physical sacrificial system to appease all the demands of the gods. It was all taking place in this physical location called temple or spiritual house. Not so for Christianity, which we'll get to in a moment, because the church is also described as a family. A few verses later, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. We have the same bloodline, the same background that transcends the differences of life. We're family. Very different than a club. A club functions so that you can pick your members. The pretty ones, the tall ones, if you're Dutch, the short ones, if you're German like me, and you can pick the people in your club who are most like you, if that's what you want. But you're born into a family, for good or for bad, and you grow up with your siblings, whether you like it or not. We're a family. And there's one more image that I want to focus in on for just a few moments, and that is the image that we are living stones. Because Christianity is so different than the culture. Unlike the culture of the first century, there were no physical sacrifices that the church made, only spiritual. There was no house of priests, just a royal priesthood, one singular. No physical structure where the church had to go to encounter God. And while there was no physical temple, there was a temple. The temple was wherever the people of God gathered. That was temple. The people themselves were the spiritual temple of God. That is where you find God, and that is how you access God, and that is how you experience God. You find the presence of God wherever God's people gather whether that be in a building, in a front yard, or in a home. 
Now we are used to the teaching in 1 Corinthians that says our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So true. Peter uses another analogy. The community, whenever it gathers, is the temple of God, built out of living stones. Sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend that we're a, a community or a spiritual house when we get together, probably because our society is built in such a transactional relationships that we have all over. This is what I mean by transactional relationships. We work at a company because it gives us a financial reward. You work, you get something back. Or you work there because it gives you some sort of status of a place of where you are. Or we join a club because there are certain services that we like or, or we, we just want to belong and that's easy enough to do. And we can often carry this idea that goes on within our society into the church. Why do you come to church? Because you like the people? Good. You prefer this type of music? The events you go to help you spiritually? And it gets you to experience God in the way you want to. If these are our reasons, it becomes highly transactional. Because you see, when the music is off that week, or the preacher is off, or a stranger comes into the group, or there's a call to give a little bit more, we'll go elsewhere. That's not how a spiritual house works. A physical building has each stone radically connected to all of the other stones. The wall can only be stable the house can only stand if all of the stones are there. That's the imagery Peter is painting. Both the wall needs the stones, and each stones need the wall. They are connected together. There are stones above a certain stone. If you want to pick out a stone, that's you. There's a certain stones that are above. Those are the stones that you support. There are stones beside you. Those are the stones that make sure you stay in alignment. There are stones below you. Those are the stones that you are built upon. The ones that hold you up. And it reminds us that we need each other. We need people. We need people on the base who are stronger than us. We need people to the side that are going to hold us mutually accountable. And we need people above that we can hold them up to help them see the beautiful thing that God has created them to be. The implication is that we need to be a part of a small group. We need to participate in worship. We need to be a part of a faith community in a significant way. It means having close relationships that you can support and that others can support you in. What Peter is saying in these opening verses of chapter 2 is if you really want to experience God, it doesn't happen so much in a building. But it can if that's where the people of God gather. because you experience God when you are being built up by others. And that word that's being used, that you are being built, is a word that could be better translated from its original as being continually built. It's talking about an ongoing process verb. The building is still going on. It wasn't just built once and left alone. The building that God is doing continues to go on. More stones continue to be added to the walls. So if you want to connect deeply with others and you want to connect deeply with God, it doesn't happen 
so much on a mountaintop. It happens in community. For we are a spiritual house. We are a priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices to God. And because of this, the church lives a very different way of life than the life that's found in our culture. These words. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave the spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. When I was in seminary, I heard this term, and I've always liked it, that we are resident aliens. It comes from a book. We live and we work within this world, but with a different set of values from this world. Different practices that speak about a different culture, with a different ethnos from this culture. Christian author Michael Green, in his book Evangelism in the Early Church, writes that the first century church was completely distinct from every single culture that it found itself in. There are certain traits about the church that transcended whether it was in Israel or Turkey or Syria or Macedonia. Certain traits that made the church famous and unusual. At the same time, it had words that described it as integrity, empathy, hospitality, generosity, chastity, caring, faithfulness, courage, seeking equity. The church was known as people who were honest and transparent in their business dealings. They were consistently fair. That caught people's attention. They were generous. They were sacrificial in their giving. They were kind to their employees. They helped strangers in need. They would open up their homes to travelers who needed a place to stay. A great sign of hospitality. This struck the people within the cultures. They were compassionate and not vindictive. They forgave others and sought to be reconciled. They were not ruthless. They were filled with chastity. They were committed to fidelity within marriage and no sex outside of the marriage bond. And they handled suffering with peace and courage. And they worked for social equity and justice. And the list goes on. And it caught people by surprise in every single culture that the church popped up in. In Rome, they didn't go to gladiatorial games. They were against infanticide, which was the ancient form of abortion. They empowered women. They gave to the poor. They had faith in a single God when there were so many gods that the others were trying to make happy. It was unlike anything the world had ever seen. And in an authentic, thriving Christian community, it is still unlike anything the world has ever seen. Because the way they lived was ludicrous. How does that fit within our culture? I mean, the church holds to things like social equity, caring for the poor, empowering the disadvantaged. That kind of sounds more like politically the, the, the liberal end of the political spectrum. But the church also holds to keeping away from sex outside of marriage forbidding infanticide. That some of these things seem more on the conservative political spectrum. So where does the church fall? I like it this way. Regarding liberal and conservative, Christianity is greater than both.
their claims of absolute truth are offensive to some. So while we live within a culture, we affirm the values of our Father and his community. And when the church does so, it is admired and alien all at the same time. We not only hold to living a different way, but understanding that everything that we do affects our community, including sin. I mention this because Peter begins this chapter with a list of sins that we'll get to in just a moment. The thing about uh, sin is that the church often views sins as completely individualistic. It's easy for us to follow the way of the culture that says, what I do on my own time, with my own resources, and with my own body is my private affair. Really? Look at some of the sins that are mentioned by Peter in this chapter. Deceit is not just misinformation. It's deliberately misrepresenting truth and bringing up falsehood that makes people less trusting of others. Envy, when you're more interested in what other people have or their position, makes one resentful and starts to feel entitled in how they treat others. Hypocrisy means you lack integrity. It literally means you have two minds. And people trust you less and they trust others less. And slander and gossip, they impact others. And even sex is not a private affair. We're all friends here. So let's go there for a moment. Sex is a private act that has implications that are significant. It's one of the most vulnerable acts one can do. And when it is done within a faithful, trustworthy, marital relationship, it has this power to unite intimately. But outside of that context, it causes distrust, betrayal, disappointment, and harm, physically, emotionally, spiritually. We are a spiritual house, depending on each other to be truthful, to interact honestly with each other, supporting each other and being supported. Because if one stone crumbles, the whole wall is in danger. And when we live out the values of this new nation, it provides strength and stability. In the first century, in the time of Peter and Paul, early Christians did not engage in a whole lot of public preaching. We might think that they did, and that's how the church grew, but they didn't really engage in a whole lot of public preaching. It was, it was way too dangerous. But yet, and I, I think I'm using from just pulling back things that I have read and heard and, and studied in the past, I think I'm probably using a conservative assessment that in the early centuries, the church grew by 40% a decade. Why was that? Because they had great preachers, because there were awesome sermons, or was it that the people lived such attractive lives that Christian, their non-Christian neighbors wanted a part of it? Church is a way of life. In doing so, the church has the power to bring change not just in people, but in a society. To be a transforming community in which God places us in. 
Again, verses 4, 6, and 7. Come to him, the living stone. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Let me close by sharing three things about these verses, about how God wants to use us to be a transforming power within society. First, it's about acknowledging that Jesus is our cornerstone. He is our cornerstone. Everyone is building their lives on something. Building on something. Everyone has a cornerstone. The cornerstone is that place where the walls meet. It's the foundation, it's the basis that holds everything together. It makes sure everything else is supported and in alignment. And if the cornerstone cracks, fails, the entire building is in jeopardy of falling. That's the imagery of cornerstone. And you know what your cornerstone is when your life becomes unstable. When your life makes you tremble. That's when you know what your cornerstone really is. When your world shakes, this is what you rest upon. Now, if your cornerstone happens to be your relationships, those relationships will eventually crumble. Not all of them, but a significant part. If it is your career that validates you, or if you think that being a good, moral, and upright person is your cornerstone, when that cornerstone shakes, your whole life will tremble. Today is the day of the big game with people that built their whole life upon to get there. Professional athletes have trained their whole life to build a career that gets to this point. Many don't make it. Many have their career cut short by injury, forced to retire, and for many, we have heard the story time and again. They are utterly devastated. They end in financial ruin and relational problems. Because we all build on a cornerstone. But there is only one that's unshakable. And that cornerstone is Jesus. So the first thing that we do is to make sure that we acknowledge that he is our cornerstone. And then secondly, we need to see him as precious. It doesn't say that this stone is reliable, though he is. It says that the cornerstone is precious. And what that means is we need to believe more than who Jesus is and that he came to earth and lived and died as payment for my sin and rose again to give new life. It is more than simply an intellectual assent of that. It is a belief that this is truly beautiful and precious and it deeply affects my heart as much as my mind. And it allows this beauty to shine out of my life. It's precious. Let's say that there is a new medicine for a rare disease. And you are offered this medicine, but you got to buy it. And it's very, very expensive. But you don't have the disease. The disease doesn't run in your family. In fact, you don't know anyone in your network who has this disease. And so you ask, why would I sell everything that I have in order to get the money to buy this bottle of medicine. But if someone has this medicine, which is very, very expensive, and you find your child has this disease, 
new ball game. Who wouldn't sell everything they have to get that medicine? And it becomes precious. Because what are our possessions after all? They don't even hold a candle to the things that are so precious to us. You'd give up everything for that. To be a follower of Jesus is to say Jesus is so precious, so lovely, that I would gladly give it all up to get him for him. And all other cornerstones are worthless in comparison. He is precious because it says the world rejected him and said he was worthless. But on the cross, God's ultimate display of love, he gave us the medicine for our sin. And there on the cross, Father God cast the chosen one aside while on the cross so that we could become his chosen ones. And when we get this, that is not only just true, but lovely and precious, we will grasp him and never let him go. We need to see him as precious. And then we just line up ourselves with the cornerstone. All the stones are lined up based on the cornerstone. Jesus gave his everything for us, and he did this to bring us into his community, to build us into a spiritual house. And the phrases that are used to describe the church, I will again say, they are all singular and not plural. It is not a collection of peoples, plural, but an entire people, singular. A royal priesthood, singular. Not royal priests, the way that's worded. A chosen people, singular. Not a collection of peoples, plural. They're all singular. Collectively being built into a holy temple to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. And every other cornerstone is unstable. A house where there is generosity, hospitality, truthfulness, fidelity, honor. And we rid ourselves of all sins because they all affect the community. God created us to connect deeply with others. Not just to meet our need to belong, but to be formed into a different kind of community that can only be defined as godlike. So let us strive with the power of the Spirit to hold to this community of God. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Father God, we bless you once again for your great love. We thank you for creating us and drawing us into your community. Thank you that you saw us as precious, so that you offered your son for us. Help us to grow in our love for you, to connect deeply this week. Help us to grow in our love for others. We pray, Lord, for this world that we are in. And for this world, we pray for peace. We continue to rise here, the rising tensions in the Ukrainian border. We pray for peace. The nation will not rise up against nation, that your intervention will keep war away. We pray for the rising tension within our own nation, knowing that this has taken differences to a whole new level. We pray for these divisions to be knocked down for reconciliation. And use us however you want to, your church, to be a part of the reconciliation that's needed. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bring healing to our community and our country and our world. 
We pray, Lord, that you will let your church minister in ways that bring hope and your presence to all we meet and serve. We lift up our faith community to you. For Gail and Gil and Joe and Pam, that your grace and goodness will abound. For Dan and Rosemary and Sue, and Dale and Dot and Nikki. We pray for elders and deacons and this period of nominating new ones. We thank you for your ongoing gift of leadership to Discovery. Please be working in all of our hearts as we reflect on women and men that you have gifted and strengthened to be leaders in our midst. We pray for families that are struggling on so many levels. We pray for those struggling with finances, with parenting, with caring for aging parents, struggling with extreme brokenness. Father, we pray for your wisdom and strength to lift our families up and families that are close to us. Will you provide wisdom and grace and love in full abundance? We lift up our neighbors. Use us to shine your light of grace. We pray for our neighbors this week on 72nd Street that you will bring an extra blessing to them, that they would know that these blessings come from you. And we lift up our missionary partner, Bridge Street. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to protect them, to care for them, lift them up, strengthen them, and guide them as they serve such a wide variety of people and help all the different communities that they have an impact in to see this community of yours as so very different and so very attractive. We thank you for your grace. Bolster our resolve to live lives of love and kindness so that you are honored. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son who makes all this possible. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone agreed and said, Amen.
cut the shackles from the slaves. Those who hate you, you ransom. Give your blood for their shame. With the bad stem, your tender. Shield the smoldering flame. You bring home the unwanted. Call the lost back by name. You are good, and all you do is good. You are good, and all you do is good. You are good, and all you do is good. And all you do is good. And all you do is good. You lift up you, you revive you, you restore you, you increase you, you anoint you, you fill up you, you spill out you, you release you, you make grow you, you bring forth you, you call out you. is eternal not in measure but kind running over with healing inexhaustible mind you and us and we in you the delight in your face resting here we enjoy you and our joy is our praise. And you are good, and all you do is good. You are good, and all you do is good. You are good, and all you do is good. And all you do is good, and all you do is good. I'd like to invite you all now to our talkative time as we've been doing the last few weeks. Um, feel free to move around as needed to find a few people to discuss with. Uh, we'll just take some time in fellowship with each other, talking about some of the points from today's talk. Um, obviously, there's more questions than we can probably get through, so you know, take your picks, but we'll give us some time to talk about them.
consider this your 30 second warning to wrap up whatever thoughts you want to complete. And then we can gather back together. As, as we close in worship, I'm going to read the last couple of verses of 1 Peter 2. And it says, just to remind us yet again, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And I invite you to join us as we sing these last two closing songs together.
my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. Paul has the announcements today. Filling in for Evan as we close out. Uh, Discovery's Youth is going to be gathering for a festive time. I got stuck in my here we go. That's the time of uh, rock climbing in just a couple weeks on February 27. It's going to be a great and fantastic time of gathering together. So uh, put that on your calendars for uh, families to be aware of. It's going to be a wonderful time that Evan and his uh, trusted helper is going to be working with him and getting that ready. Uh, and I've got a few other slides. There we go. Uh, if you're wanting to be a part of a uh, gathering community, there is a group that is uh, meeting online by Zoom on Thursday mornings. 
You can find the information in your worship bulletin, but also on Monday memos and the link for that of gathering as a, as a discipleship group on Thursday mornings. Nominations, this is the last day or tomorrow, uh, sometime soon, for nominating someone for the role, the ministry of uh, elder or deacon. And if you have someone you would like to nominate, please make sure you can get those nominations in. Our uh, mobile food pantry is this week, and uh, that's this Wednesday. If you're able to help out in some capacity with that, if you could be here at least by 4.30, that would really help us out to be able to uh, serve our neighbors uh, in a variety of ways. And there's also a Just Show Up that happens on Wednesday evening. It combines fellowship, study of God's word, and prayer, all within uh, 75 minutes. So it's a great time to gather together and to uh, just to have an enjoyable time, uh, not just with each other, but with God's in our presence. Receive God's parting blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance upon you, wrap his arms around you, smile down on you, give you his peace. All God's people said, amen. Go in peace.